to another edition of the Kingdom War Room. Today's episode is entitled 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. With me today, I have my cohort in Kingdom Endeavors, Dr. Mike Spaulding, and it's good to have him back with us. We missed him last month. And today we have my good friend, Eric Walker. Now, Eric is the uh, executive director of Igniting a Nation Ministries in Birmingham, as well as a best-selling author and sought after speaker, teacher in prophecy in the news. After 35 years in working in a corporate America, he devoted himself to full-time ministry and founded one of the largest Messianic congregations in the world. He has hosted, co-hosted, and been a regular contributor to, to hundreds of radio and TV programs. He has been a strong media voice and averages over 250 in-person speaking engagements a year. God bless you, Eric, for that. You have more stamina than I do. Uh, he is a strong advocate for Israel and uh, taking groups there annually. His traditional Jewish upbringing and faith and journey to faith in Jesus gives him a unique perspective on both the Old and New Testament. Originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he is a Penn State alumni and holds both rabbinical and Baptist ordination. Now, the first thing I want to ask you, Eric, on this, I tell people I am a Bapticostal with a, with a good twist of Hebraic heritage. Does this make you a rabbi Baptist? It makes me a Pentecostal, <clears throat> uh, pe Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jew. There you go. So I get all the bases covered. And after 45 years immersed in the synagogue and the synagogue teachings, coming to faith in Jesus was the ultimate graduate course, the ultimate graduation to the fullness of the Bible, the fullness of understanding God in uh, a complete, total, connected, not disconnected, but singular message carried all the way through in a common language, common imagery, common thought, and it was from the Hebrew mind. You know, anyone that I know that has been Jewish that has come to faith, when they when they when they connect with Jesus, once that veil is lifted, all of a sudden the continuity and and uniformity of the Old Testament explodes with meaning like they have never seen before. Did this is that something that you experienced in this whole process? It, it's almost like you're reading the screenplay is the Old Testament. And then you get to watch the play. You get to, the, the, so, so you're, you're there, you're there at the casting call, you're there at the script writing, you're there at the script reading. And then all of a sudden, the opening act is Matthew 1 1. The curtain goes up and you're introduced. And all of a sudden, all these things that you know about are now played out and make complete sense. And so it's really been a journey of not confusion, but clarification. Oh, and Amen, there, amen. There are so many scriptures that the rabbis almost forbid you to study, especially out of Daniel in different places, and all of a sudden those explode with meaning as well. Yes, yes, amen. Yeah, the fact that, that traditional Judaism denies the prophetic Na naming of Daniel as a prophet is inherent to understanding why the Jewish world is not embracing things like, well, don't you know that your efforts to build the third temple is to build the tribulation, tribulation temple for the Antichrist and to usher in three quarters of your demise? No, they don't see that at all because he wasn't a prophet according to the legal definition of a prophet, was a messenger of God. Thus says the Lord. And when we read Daniel, we see that he was a hoser. He was a visionary. He was a man that was given dreams and visions. All came to pass and just as valid, just as Joseph was a hoser, not a prophet. We don't call Joseph with the coat of many colors, Joseph uh, in, in, in Egypt. We don't call him a prophet. We refer to him not in the uh, prophetic. We refer to him as a visionary, as someone God gave dreams and visions and deep understanding. Daniel sits in the Jewish world in that classification and is not in the Navi, 
of the Tanakh. He is in the Ketuvim, in the writings. And because of that, they don't give him the same weight. The, the, the concept of minor prophet, major prophet is mind blowing. If you're a prophet of God and you're in the Bible, you're major. I don't care who you are, you're major. To, to relegate and to have this cavalier attitude of I'm gonna name the minor prophets. Oh, that I should be the most minor prophet that ever walked the face of this earth and had my name recorded for eternity in the scriptures of God. Oh, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, we, we, we talk about major and minor prophets by the volume of that which they produce, not the significance of their prophetic words, which is really lacks understanding, I think, from, from a Gentile point of view. And leaves so much room for misinterpretation because it, it, it's, it's so amazing how some of these things come together. You know, Proverbs writes, uh, King Solomon writes, that when, there, when there are many words, sin abounds. So, you know, the one who talks the most, there are lots of words. Well, you take a look at the major prophets, lots of words. Does that mean that they were lots of words because sin abounds? No, these are the words of God. But if we take a look at the erroneous amount of volumes of literature written about those major prophets with their major words, it adds volumes of more sin, more misunderstanding, more false predictions, more leading people into a false sense of understanding of what God's message is. And it allows us to amplify what God has already made clear. We, we have had these conversations many times. Dr. Mike, I'm so glad to meet you and to have you as, as uh, such a sterling part of this. And anybody that Dr. Michael Lake holds in such high regard is an automatic uh, mensch to me because I have such utmost respect for him and his ministry, his wisdom, and his uncompromising uh, clarity as to what the word says and what the word doesn't say. And I, I'm, I'm not a, a one who gives a lot of accolades toward man because we're all butt dust. Yes, amen. <laughs> You know, you know, we're, we're all dirt. Uh, we all came from the same place. We're all going to the same place. I mean, how much value is there in dirt? What you do with the dirt? And so he's built. And so I appreciate that. And so as we look at this, we we find that there have been people who have been led down a path where they've grabbed a hold of what they think are the brass rings of the faith or they're the um listen when I, i'm a passenger in a car i automatically reach for the handle that's above the door i don't ride in anybody's car when my hand is not gripped on that that handle they put that handle there for me i'm always there <laughs> but we have people who that's their lifeline and their lifeline of what they've been taught in scripture is not the lifeline of god and yes. that's a yeah. burden that they've been taught the wrong thing. And they're going down this path of misunderstanding because they put so much faith in people like ourselves, depending on us to steer them correctly. And then they like that. It agrees with them. It sounds right. I'm going to grab a hold of that. Someone's salvation is God's responsibility. He's the one who saves. He uses people like ourselves to present truth, but there's so many versions of truth that we have to be so dedicated, so diligent in making sure that what we say is well-researched, well-founded, clear, and does not tickle the ear. And I'm, I'm well-known, Dr. Lake knows I'm well-known for being an equal opportunity offender. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it's in my DNA. Mike, Mike, can I share the same DNA? <laughs> so there you go. Well, one of the things, one of the many things, Rabbi Eric, I got to tell you that uh, about your book that really um, blessed me was, um, and, and again, in this conversation, I'm sure that I'll, I'll bring many more out, but but the one that I liked uh, right off the bat, it was apparent to me 
that you were calling people, calling modern American Christians to to begin to think Hebrew, begin to think like a Hebrew through the lens of the old. And, and I love that because I love the Old Testament. And I love the way you just, in fact, I wrote this down. I'm going to quote you later. Um, the Old Testament, because I like to call them the Hebrew scriptures. Right. The Hebrew scriptures are the screenplay. The apostolic scripture is the actual cinema. So you get to watch what has already been written, and now it's it's played out right in front of our eyes. I love that. And, and I have to say that Dr. Uh, Lake has been a dear, dear friend to me and has helped me to think Hebrew, to to read the scriptures in that context and with that mindset, how they would have understood it and received it um, in, in the culture of the day and what they thought about that. So very, very important point. And, and I think it goes a long way towards reorienting modern american christianity because uh, rabbi eric I, I like your thoughts modern american church has lost its way completely so far off track the simple quote as a jew i i came into this thinking okay i've been introduced to the new testament new covenant bread hadashah whatever you want to call it it's fine with me there's not a legalistic bone in my body, but I can't change my mind. Matthew thought Hebrew, regardless of what language he spoke. You talk to any bilingual, any culturally raised individual, you are going to think first in your first, now you ultimately learn to think like you've been taught to think, but your natural inclination, especially your imagery. This is where your word pictures, because we are we are mentally visual. We see with our mind's eye. And so the pictures being painted, the word pictures throughout in the entirety, Matthew to Revelation are Hebrew thought, Hebrew mind, Old Testament Hebrew imagery. There is nothing with 500 or more references to Old Testament scriptures found in the book of Revelation alone. You see that John has a Hebrew mind and he's thinking of Hebrew imagery and he's weaving together a tapestry that says what was, what is, what is to come. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like modern Jesuit in its nature. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I told you. And now I, I, I'm going I'm to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell it to you. And now I'm going to tell you what I told you. And that's going to sink it in those threes. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation does. And so if you were a, a Hebrew mindset person, you might say, I could have actually just read Genesis, Exodus, and Revelation and understood exactly what was coming down the pike because I've seen it, yeah. I've experienced it, and now I understand what's about to take place. But the question is, and this is the burning desire in my heart, is to make sure that when, they, when, when God looks out on his congregation and everybody proclaims, I believe, I believe, I believe, are you on the sheep side? Or are you on the goat side? Because you're all in the same building. You're all in the church that we call the modern day church and you're all in there and you're worshiping on Sunday morning, but not all of you are going to hear, come, welcome. You're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. And it, it grieves my heart that this ministry of preaching the gospel is not enough. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's not enough to have that as the only message. We have to tell people it's what you do. Your testimony is not you were a troll living under a bridge. Your testimony is what has happened to you since. 
your second Corinthians 517 experience from that moment when you became a new creation, what has God done for you? That's the story we need to tell. And that's the compelling story. And that's the transformation. And I can't be changed from something if I've been molded by somebody that only knows how to make one thing one way. We all turn out the same. And if that's the case in the seminaries, not like biblical life, not like what you're doing, but the mainstream denominational seminaries only know how to make one piece of clay, and they're pushing them out there with people who only know how to make one piece of clay. And when you line them all up, they're all clay soldiers, and they're all going to get knocked down and turned into dust, and my heart grieves because they've missed it. And we have people who have so much sway that use words like well, we the church need to divorce ourselves from the Old Testament. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, of course, you know, that goes back a long way, but I think even in many of the seminaries, one of the things I've discovered back in the 1920s, a lot of them were invaded by communists. And when <laughs> you divorce us from the Old Testament, you can make the New Testament because you have gotten rid of your Webster's Dictionary, okay? All the definitions are in the Old Testament, and it never changes. Once you do that, you can make the New Testament basically say anything that you want because you create new definitions. And that's exactly what the emergent church is doing and so many of these movements that are leading people astray. And, you know, one of the things I think that you have brought out in this book is Genesis 3.15 is, in, in essence, the mother of all prophecies. Everything else has to line up with that. Because it's about redemption. You know, then we, we get to later on in Genesis at the Tower of Babel. Not only is it about redemption, but then Jesus is going to get his nations back that he when he when he divorced humanity at the Tower of Babel. It's all about getting everything back from the devil. And unless we understand that and then be learning to be conformed into his image, we miss everything. I could not find a single prophecy in scripture whose foundational truth was not tied to preserving the seed line of Messiah. Mm -hmm. When God sent us into the promised land and he went out and he wiped out the parasites and the termites and the, and the, and the I'm afraid of heights and all the heights that he did. And everybody today talks about, oh, that mean smiting God, that mean angry God. He just went out there and willy nilly killed everybody. He took out the ones that would have killed the seed line of Messiah. He did that for our benefit and our sake. And he did that all along with the messengers of God that kept saying, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, you're going to lose that. However, because of God's sovereignty and his promise, as he spoke to Ezekiel, what, what do you, uh, to, I'm, I'm sorry, not to Ezekiel, but to, um, to Elijah, what are you so afraid of? I've reserved for myself a remnant. I've, I've, this is my plan. Jesus didn't come out of the womb with a beautiful attache case with Jesus' plan of salvation. He came to this world with God's plan of salvation, and we have so lost our relationship with the Father. We have so relegated Christianity to being all about Jesus. The Father eliminated. The Holy Spirit God forbid you should talk about the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and have a miraculous healing take place and a leg grow out in a Baptist service at 10 o'clock in the morning. Shh, don't tell anybody his leg just grew out. Don't tell anybody. Stop the message. Stop the music. Get up there. Put this person up there and say, God just did this through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Why are we so afraid of an authentic move of God? Yeah. The old Baptists used to have enough sense to know that the devil wasn't healing Baptists. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing to me. And, and, the, the the God of the Bible, the one true God, Elohim, Adonai, Hashem, Yad Hey Vav Hey, Yahweh. I don't I don't care about the naming. I care about the identity. 
of the creator who throughout scripture has given us one line, one solid titanium cable, not a crimson strand of thread so easily broken that, oh, this one contradicts this. It is seamless from Genesis 3.15 all the way through Revelation, and it is never broken. It is never cracked, kinked, chipped, fractured, or forgotten. And there's a calling. And there's an unraveling of a secret that's so obvious, I don't know how it's a secret among three billion people in the world. The greatest secret is Jesus isn't coming back until the Jews get on board and your calling as a church was to the Jew first. Jesus' calling was to the Jew first. He said to the woman, I didn't come for you. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sent the disciples out and said, listen, go. Don't go to the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jerusalem, you're not going to see me again until you, not your friends in Rome, not your buddies persecuting, until the leadership of Jerusalem, the day before the people said it, now he's talking to somebody else, somebody different, a different audience. The leaders who rejected him a year and a half before when they accused him of casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub, he cursed that generation. He said, this wicked generation will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But now he's speaking to leadership saying, you, you are charged with this and you're not going to see me again. I'm not coming back until you call for my return. Why are we not teaching people and unified Jew and Gentile, one, I, I, please celebrate the feast. Don't celebrate the feast. Celebrate the Sabbath. Don't celebrate the Sabbath. Eat kosher. Don't eat kosher. I don't care. That's between you and God. You do whatever you feel right. But for, for the love of God and for the return of Messiah, can we not be the two of Ephesians 2 of the one new man, Jew? There have to be Jews. There have to be Gentiles. We have to be different. But why can't we work together? This is the message of society and racism and hatred and disunity and dis-ease and discomfort and spiritual malaise and false doctrine. And all has to do with the enemy who's been told in Genesis 3.15, here's who is going to do this to you. And here's how he's going to do it. But you know what I'm not going to tell you? I'm not going to tell you when. So you go about like anybody else that's been given a death sentence. Get a stay of execution. File your motions. Get this appeal. Get this group to advocate for you, to raise money for you, to go build a church for you, to go support you, to go fight for you, to keep you from your demise and see how many chances you get. And for 30, well, for 5,000 years, but for 3,500 years since we came into being, we can see it play out. And it's diabolical. And when Messiah rose again, and this was another chance, look at how he kicked it into high gear with Herod trying to kill the boys, infant infanticide. You got Hitler. You got another genocide going on. You have the highest level of anti-Semitic rhetoric since World War II, and there's no doubt that people want to kill the Jews and the church. Yes, As we look at denominational Christianity, of which, what, 88, 89% of those who identify as Christians belong to a mainstream denomination? That's billions of people have no idea. No, they don't. And in, in, the, in, the, in the situation we're in now, not only is anti-Semitism at an all-time high, now I'm beginning to hear rhetoric from the left that everything that's wrong in America is Christianity's fault. Yeah. And yeah. We, we need to understand that we're joined at the hip and we need to start praying for one another. You know, I, I had years ago, I had one rabbi uh, and I was kind of corresponding with him in Israel and and uh, he said, uh, he said, I bet you pray every day that I come to Jesus. And I said, I do that second. I said, the first thing I do is pray that you would rediscover Moses and lay everything else down. Because until you start hearing the purity of Moses, you're never going to discover who Messiah is. 
And and I, I think that's, that's part of our, our job as believers. We not only have to believe the whole word, and I think you know, when the Apostle Paul said that it was uh, our job to cause the Jews to be jealous, and I've heard some crazy stuff like, we're all going to become billionaires and we're going to make them all jealous. No, no. <laughs> It's when we start living the commandments of God under the same anointing that the Messiah had, and we start producing the same signs and wonders as Messiah has, and we can hear the voice of God the same way that Messiah had, you get that around a Jewish person and their hearts begin to burn. 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 Yeah. Provoking somebody. Listen, my testimony is in the book, and I talk about my Gentile friends telling me they need to go to church. I go, why would I need to go to church? You killed my people. You yeah. killed my people. I lost over half my family. You killed my people. You have pastors who are screaming against the Jews. You had a church that was silent. Why would I want to join together with those that would plot my demise? Why would I want that? What's, what's attractive to me? But the way they loved me and the way they provoked me, and they did provoke me. They provoked me to anger. But then they provoked me to jealousy because they finally said, all we care is for you to hear the truth one time. You go one time. If you never want to go back, to, we love you enough. Will you do that for us? We'll even take you. You know, that made me even matter. I said, what do I need a Gentile to take me to see something really Jewish? What do you know about being Jewish? What do you know about not even knowing the name of an uncle that died? What do you know about, about growing up being called a Christ killer? What do you know about it? And you're telling me, oh, it's really Jewish. And that made me so mad. I got up, I was supposed to go a week later, but I got up on a Saturday morning with the attitude of, what do I need a Gentile to show me what's Jewish? And I went and I heard the message and I raised my hand and it changed my entire life. And I finally understood not just the heart of my own people, but the heart of God. When I began to listen to some of the lies that I finally was able to recall, they weren't fresh in my memory. Things like the argument, one person can't save the world. That's an old long-term argument you heard long ago, you stick it away somewhere. You, Look at all the one look at all the ones God used. Joseph. We were down to 70 plus Joseph. That's 71. The number of the Sanhedrin. Cool. That's extinction. If you told me that there was in your home state, Missouri, right? Yeah. That there was a speckled newt that was discovered on a major multi-billion dollar construction project. And they only found 71 of them. And if you did that project, they would become extinct. What would have happened? The project would have been stopped. They would have protected the 71. We, the Jewish people, was Joseph and the 70. That's all that were left in the world. We were on the verge of extinction. And one stood up. Esther, we were one strike of a pen, one signet ring away from total annihilation, and one brings about our redemption. How can you not argue through Judaism, through the text of the Bible, that God always used one, one, Moses, Adam, Abraham, Look at all the ones that he used. So then you can come along and say, oh, well, Jesus can't save the world because one man can't save the world. One saved our people time and time and time and time again. Yeah. All support. Yeah. Makes a big difference when that one is God. Amen. 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 It's with the other ones, but this one was almighty God come in the flesh that shed his blood for us, he paid the price when he was the one that was the one offended. And yet he came and paid the price. And all the word of God, every everything is so Christ-centric that Jesus is the epicenter of everything in the word of God. 
and that's when it comes into clarity. That's when it comes into focus. And I am I'm really concerned what I'm seeing right now in a, a lot of the Hebraic heritage movement that they they've begun denying Christ. I see attacks on the Apostle Paul, and there's there's a lot of uh, a cognitive dishonesty going on, intellectual dishonesty because they say, well, you know, the Apostle Paul quoted uh, things out of Greek philosophy. Yes, he did. You know why? He was trained at the school of Hillel to do that when you're dealing with Gentiles. Right. And so you just, you not only condemn Paul, you condemn Gamaliel, you condemn the entire school of Hillel. But yet they, all this stuff goes on because people are, are not truly educated. And I don't think that we, ha we as, as a people have truly showed them the magnificence of who Jesus is near in the full scope that we should have. When we look at the sovereignty of God, and Dr. Spalding, I know that you are passionate about the sovereignty of God and, and what you write and what you preach and what you talk about, the sovereignty of God. Here God creates, and we have this amazing relationship. I just had this conversation this morning. Do we know for a fact that Adam and Eve did not ever eat from the tree of life? We're not told. And so when Satan says to Eve, surely you won't die, does he have knowledge that they've already eaten from the tree of life? Does he have that prior knowledge? These are things we don't know. But yet, what we do know is compelling enough for us to be on the right side, to want to be on the right side of this equation. There's things that there are not answers to. And let's be clear, the Bible doesn't tell us everything. In Judaism, we look at the Bible as a set of instructions as to what to do, but rarely does God tell us how to do it. He says, write my words on the doorpost of your house. Okay, I'm all in. How do I do that? Do I do a pen knife and a scribe, or do I um, paint it, or do I? How do I write it on the doorpost of my house? Every doorpost? Which doorpost? Do I do it to the bathroom doorpost? Well, that doesn't sound right. But why should I forget the word of God when I go into the bathroom? Why should it not be on the door? I, I don't know how to do this, but I'm supposed to do it. So we create this little box called a mezuzah, meaning doorpost, and we stick a little scroll in there, and we think we've accomplished that. I don't know if we accomplished it. We did accomplish it. He says, tie them as reminders. Okay, well, how? Well, they make these boxes, and they make these straps and stuff like that. Is that the right way? We don't know. He just says, do it. He doesn't give us, he's not a micromanager. What he did manage was the most important thing to him. And that was the structure of the tabernacle that he told us all the details, laid out all the elements, gave us the inventory, gave us the weights, gave us the measures, gave us the details, told us how to do it because that was gonna be the place he was. Where we are is not the Garden of Eden. Where we are is not heaven. And so do we have to be that concerned with whether or not I so legalistically write the doorpost on the doorpost of my house? No. But do I have to make sure that I have 50 clasps and I have to have silver sockets and I have to have bronze sockets so that and do I have to have the right colors? And the answer is yes, because that's God's house. And so when it comes to dealing with God's house, he's very, very specific. When it comes to dealing with man's celebration, we have so much latitude and so much freedom. But we have to be on this side, not on the other side. And Satan wants to convince us. We should abandon all these other things. We should follow the ways of the world because that's what feels good. I turned 70 in January, and all of a sudden time took on a whole different significance. Time remaining. What am I going to do with time remaining? What am I going to devote it to? And the one thing that I committed myself to do was I was not going to be concerned about what people thought about what I said or thought about what I wrote. I was going to put it out there and back it up with 200 and, and whatever it is, 270, 278 citations of confirmation of people much smarter than me compiling and adding to to say, listen, here's where we are and here's how we got here. 
And if you're going to church on Sunday and you're taking everything that that man says, and God bless that man for doing it. I'm not being critical of that man. I'm saying he needs to stop and say, is what I'm saying really what the Bible says? Yeah. I have to ask, and we are all personally responsible for our own spiritual condition. And if I assign that to you, that is a burden you don't deserve. That's a punishment you don't deserve. Amen. Amen. Well, Rabbi Eric, I, I want to, this is especially for our friends who've joined us, um, encourage them to get the book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, um, especially if you love history. Because Rabbi Eric, uh, your book was a historian's dream because you laid out from right from the beginning all the way to where we are today, Satan's strategies, his manipulations, his methodologies, everything he's done. And friends, listen, to our shame, and when I say our, I'm talking about the modern American church, to our shame, we have played a significant role in coming against God's people. So one of the, one of the, valuable things about your book, Rabbi Eric, is that it is a, my prayer and hope is that it will serve as a course correction yes. for those who find themselves in, in the body of Christ in places that are bad-mouthing the Jewish people who are laying out arguments for divesting and, and, and boycotting and, and speaking about the Palestinians as, as being the rightful heirs of the land and, and so on and so forth. I think this book, friends, will provide you a course correction if, if you are caught up in some faux, extra-biblical, extraneous theology that says the church has replaced Israel this book can be a valuable course correction for you, and I would encourage you to get the book. So thank you, Rabbi Eric, for including that, that voluminous material that if someone will take the time to read it, there is no doubt that Satan has done a masterful work to deceive modern American Christians. Amen. Amen. It, it was my hope and prayer to do an expose without condemnation just say here's what happened i wasn't there when they named it easter i'm not going to take any responsibility for ishtar or for don't throw that on me i wasn't there but if you want to know how we got there here's how we got here and here's how we got so far off the mark and when you begin to look at the fact that if everybody's crying out come jesus come ask yourself the question why is three and a half billion voices not loud enough? Three and a half billion voices in unity crying out, come Jesus, come. Why hasn't he come? Why, what's the missing piece? And I wanted to add to this and say, listen, in reality, if I were to say to you, three and a half billion people crying at one time, come Jesus, come, and is God turning a deaf ear? Do we not have audience? We do have access. We do have an audience. So we're standing there. We're saying, come, Jesus, come. And he's given us the, he's shaking off the signal. You know, call for a different pitch. And the understanding oh, that's is. That's the <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if we're missing this piece and we want Jesus to come back and we listen to the words of Paul, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe, but to the Jew first. The truth of the matter, it's hard to witness to a Jew. It's not easy. It's much easier to witness. I've led thousands upon thousands of non-Jews to the Lord, and I've led maybe two or three hundred Jews to the Lord. It's hard. But with no understanding of the scripture, with no understanding of Moses, with no understanding of Moses' relationship with God, with no understanding of that conversation that took place for 40 days and 40 nights that defies medicine. You can't live three days without water and live 40. 
Who else did that happen to? Jesus. Something remarkable was going on up there in a dialogue about the true nature of God. And we missed that. Oh, Moses changed God's mind. No, he didn't. You mean God can be manipulated by a man? Well, if that was the case, then Babel would have succeeded. So if God's true nature is grace, mercy, love, and inclusion, that's for all people. He says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all people, all nations. You mean being a Gentile and being a Jew in God's economy is only a different assignment? That's all it is? You're on a team. Not everybody can be the pitcher. We wouldn't have anybody covering first base, nobody covering second base, nobody covering third base. So if everybody's a pitcher, we don't even have any hitters. That's not a game. Do I have to look down on you because I'm a catcher and you're a pitcher? I got to look down on you. Where do we get into this? How do we get so confused to where all of a sudden it's better to be a Gentile and a Christian than it is to be a Jew? This is ludicrous. This is not the Bible. And 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 why would we buy into that? Just because it's what we've been told? I've been told a lot of things in my life, but I question them. We were trained to question. Our training was question. And if you don't have three questions, if you don't have a pro, a con, and a neutral position on any part of scripture, when you're being trained and taught in Hebrew school and in Sunday school, because you don't know when you walk in what you're going to be assigned with. Defend Genesis 3.15. Oppose Genesis 3.15. Take a neutral position on Genesis 3.15. Go. That's how it worked. That's how you were taught. I can argue it the Jewish way. I can argue it the Christian way. I can argue it the Baptist way. I can argue it the Pentecostal way. I can argue it all the ways because that's how I was trained to do it. But there is only one way, and that's when you make that decision that there is only one way. And that's God's way. And I'm going to throw out man's teaching and what does God have to say about it? And if we would all just go back to the basis, much of what's in this book becomes obvious. Yeah. You know, a watershed event in my life. And this, this is back when, of course, we had witches and warlocks and everything else trying to kill us. And I had went to a conference and uh, had a bunch of Gentile scholars introduce me to my Hebraic heritage. I thought, I can really use this when I want to sound profound, you know, and I stick it back up on a shelf until I found out that they were desecrating the fall feasts, the, uh, the occult were. And I'm sitting there reading the Bible. I'm reading through the book of Revelation. And for the first time I saw the song, that is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, that it's a duet, which means that Moses and Jesus are in perfect harmony. Amen. That, that was an epiphany to me because it went against everything I had been taught. You know, Jesus conquered Moses. They were best buds. I mean, it was to the place where Moses said, listen, here's how you're going to recognize him. He's going to look like me. He's going to talk like me. He's going to be just like me. And all of a sudden, the, the word began to explode with new meaning. And at the same time, you know, God sets Mary free and she starts questioning all my theology. And for the first time, I begin, instead of giving the theological positions that I have been taught, I begin exegeting my theological positions. And I sat there and begin to say, how in the world did they teach that? And why in the world did they teach that to me so that I taught everybody else? Because that does not line up with Scripture. And I, 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 you know, it's, it's like this, come to Jesus, come to Scripture moment, if you will. The whole of Scripture, Jesus is the Word made flesh. And the word does not contradict itself. Our interpretations cause it to contradict itself. And Genesis 315, that is a titanium cable, but God being God, God fills all time and space, okay? He laid that cable from the moment he said a light be, that cable was laid and he was kicked back beyond the millennial reign. And he says, the devil can't move it. And if we get hooked into that cable, 
that's the anchor that holds. Amen. You know, and I, I think one of the things that um, a lot of the church is counting on, that handle you were talking about holding on the car, they think that's a ripcord that they can pull for it gets too rough. <laughs> but the Bible says, hold out until the end. Right. <clears throat> so how long are we supposed to be here? Until God's done. Amen. And it's time to soldier up and get back in the word and get rid of this junk that we have been taught. So, so much of it stems from Catholic theology that hated the Jews. When Constantine set the foundation and said, let us have nothing in common with the Jews. It severed the tie that kept the body balanced. And the thing that puzzles me so much is that we have from 325 AD, which is kind of like the watershed date for the doctrine of the Trinity, for the Sabbath, for Easter, that's kind of the Eusebius document that kind of sets the mark 325. So for 1700 years, we've been following this path, influenced by a man's mother, Helena. Yeah. Influenced by her. If you were to ask a Gentile, who first told you about Jesus? They'd give you some person's name. Who first told me about Jesus? Moses. Moses said, one will come after me like me. You are to do what he teaches or else you will be cut off from your people. Well, I'm on the lookout for who is teaching like Moses. And when I hear his teachings, this is why I left the corporate world. I came to faith. I left the corporate world. I couldn't do it anymore. I had knowledge that was life-changing knowledge 25 years ago, life-changing knowledge. And I sat in the boardroom of Hewlett Packard. I had a very successful career. It wasn't about the money. It was about the value of life and the meaning of life. Then I asked people the question, Whose prayer was answered in Acts chapter 2? You love that tongues of fire. You love that billowing smoke. You love that trumpet blast. You love that giving of the Spirit. Whose prayer was answered at Pentecost? Well, they say, well, Jesus's. No. John's. No. P Peter's. No. Moses. Moses? Moses's prayer was answered at Pentecost? Well, in my opinion, it was. Moses was the one when Eldad and Medad came to him and he was then said, hey, uh, I'm sorry, when, when Joshua came to him and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And he said, what are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of his were prophets and the spirit would be available to everyone for the asking. Acts chapter two, the yes. Holy Spirit became available for the first time in biblical history for everybody just for the asking. Moses's prayer, prayer, I wish, that's a prayer. I don't care how you call it. I wish that all of Israel were prophets and that the spirit would be available to everyone for the asking. If oh. I don't have a foundation, I'm building a house and I'm building a high rise building and the church wants to start on the 32nd floor. Listen, nobody loves the foundation. Nobody stands around when they're pouring the foundation saying, man, that is one fine looking foundation. You gotta really build something spectacular on top of that. Look at, look at the craftsmanship. Look at the rebar layout. Look at the way, how do they know how to distribute the load? Okay, doesn't happen. You take that elevator to the 34th floor and you look out that glass building and you're so enamored with the 34th floor and all the offices and all the beauty and all that, you've forgotten about the foundation. And you're just enjoying the moment and all of a sudden your life and you get an office there, your life doesn't begin on the first floor. It doesn't begin on the foundation. It's all your whole life has lived on the 34th floor. And I'm afraid that's where the church has gotten. We're living on the 34th floor and we need to go back to the foundation. We need to go back to the original poor. In 315, the genesis of all prophecy. When I first gave that title to Tom Horn, the president of Defender Publishing, Scott Watch TV, 
he said, man, a book with a number is a name, man. I, I, I said, can, can you just, can, can, can we get a mock-up? Just to see how it looks. I'm I'm not I'm not in love with the name. I'm not, I'm not attached to the name. I'm, I'm, I, the content will argue over content, but the name. The cover came out long before the book. We did the cover art. And he looked at it. And he said, "It works. It needs to be done. We need to attach a scripture." I get asked by um, uh, Dr. Larry, and you know him. Uh, uh, Dr. Larry Sparkamino. He said, how can you write? And he said, I was asked this question to ask you, how can you write an entire book on one verse? And I said, because I believe that it is the genesis of all prophecy. It is. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you scholars, you the experts confirm that every prophecy has woven into it the protection of the seed line. And I don't think that the church even understands the seed line. And what's so amazing about the seed line in Judaism, if my father is a Levite and my mother is a Judite, I'm a Levite. There's no such thing as a royal priest. You can't be royal Judah, Levite priest. Your father determines your lineage, unless, of course, your father is God and he can defy all the parameters of genetics and he can make you a royal priesthood. He can make you a what? A Melech Zadok. He can make you a kingly priest. He can do those miraculous things if we understand it. But the seed line is so important. And we have in the natural the story of the Methuselah seed. Three palm kernels found in Qumran with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Over 2,000 years, they lay dormant. They planted them. One grew and bore fruit, lay dormant, confirming for us that a seed can lay dormant and pass. We look at DNA, and now that we understand DNA, we know the genetic disposition and DNA and chromosome can all pass. Generation, generation appear on an activation. How does a seed activate? Okay, with light, with water, with soil, with a vessel. The activation of light, the visitation of the Holy Spirit was the activation of this dormant seed that God had prophesied in Genesis 3.14. If we don't recognize that, the seed of the woman is Jesus and the seed of the serpent is the Antichrist. If we don't recognize that, we miss all the prophecy of scripture that leads to the campaign of Armageddon, that leads to all these battles, to lead to all these leaders, all these war, all these things happen right here as God sets prophecy in motion. Yes, amen, amen. And understanding that, conversely, understanding that explains all of life, past, present, future. It, <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful truth, uh, Rabbi Eric. I, I really enjoyed the book. Dr. Spalding, you, you, you blessed me because this was a personal quest. I couldn't understand why I was so hated. I couldn't understand how I was just born like any other child into a family. And walking to school, I had Regina Jones, a little six-year-old black girl, holding hands on my right hand and Mark Tabor, little Jewish boy in my left hand, and we would walk to school together. Thought nothing of it, thought nothing of it. When we went on to, from kindergarten into, and we went from K through eight in the same school. So by the time you got to six, seven, eight, you had intramural sports and stuff like that. We began to play the Catholic schools the, and all of a sudden I was being called a Christ killer and all of a sudden I was getting beat up and all of a sudden I was going home and bruised and I didn't understand why people hated me now I went home and told my mother I was a Christ killer I said I know I get blamed for a lot of stuff but this is I wasn't there I you know this is and this was serious this was brutal to a young child so she sent me to the Catholic boys choir to join the Catholic boys choir 
because my dad worked retail. They had nothing to do with me during the holidays. The Catholic Boys Choir sang Christmas carols, so I went and sang with the Catholic Boys Choir. They wanted me to become an altar boy. I came home and they said, I said, Father McElveen wants me to become an altar boy. I said, you go back and tell him you're Jewish. So I went back and told him I'm Jewish. He said, okay, you can't be an altar boy. Uh, you can't even come here. Bye. So I got kicked out of the Catholic Boys Choir because they found out I was Jewish. This Jewish persecution, I could not understand it. I couldn't understand it when I came to faith in the Jewish Messiah and said, wait a second, all of Christianity believes what I believe. But yet, it's not okay. I can't take communion in a Catholic church because I'm not a Catholic. I'm a born Jew. Every generation, going back 16 generations on both sides of my family that I can find the paperwork more, is Jewish. There's not a Gentile in my family. As a Jewish believer, I'm denied. And there's this enmity between the Gentile church in Israel and the Jews. And it's unbiblical. This was not God's plan. God's plan is for us to play an important part and who's going to reach us if they don't know how to reach us. And if they don't know they need to reach us. And if nobody's there to educate them to say, please reach us, but don't do it the way you've been doing. Don't tell me that if I don't turn, I'm going to burn. We, we don't convert the, con the concept. Every time I see a sign that says the conversion of Paul, my, it, it, it's called your kishkas, your guts. They, they go on a knot. Paul was the Jew's Jew. He lived as a Jew. He was born a Jew. He lives it. He was raised as a Jew. He studied as a Jew. He was imprisoned as a Jew. He died as a Jew. When did Paul stop being Jewish? When did Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, okay, this big argument, let's get a Gentile in there. Was Luke a Gentile? Was Luke really a Gentile? Let me throw this in there. When Paul was charged, what was one of the charges? Was wasn't one of the charges that he brought a Gentile into the into the, to the temple? Was Peter charged with that? Didn't Luke accompany Peter into the temple? Why wasn't Peter charged with that? That was the highest crime. Why was Paul so concerned about getting Timothy circumcised, circumcised, even though they knew he was Jewish, but he wasn't circumcised to make sure? That there wasn't a violation, so he wouldn't be persecuted for that, prosecuted for that. But how did Luke make it in if he wasn't Jewish? Good question. And these are questions. I don't have the answer for it. But when I hear things and statements made like that, you got to back them up with scripture. You got to back them up with the context of the day of understanding the Socratic system, understanding the, the legalistic system of the culture, the context of the people, the dynamic, and examine it, not just follow. It. And the, part of the problem is we become party line people, denominational people. Things like once saved, always saved. Depart from me, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. I go to church every week. I'm on the goat side and depart from me. I never knew you. Did I just not lose my salvation? <laughs> or it's better to never know me than to know me and turn your back on me. Did Judas Iscariot, was he not a believer? Did he not lose his salvation? I, I don't know. Say some of these things and, and people latch onto it and say, well, this is this is what I need to hold on to. No, you need mm -hmm. to truth of the entirety of scripture god's desire is none is that none would perish but jesus said whatever you do to the least of my brothers you do to me who were jesus's brothers there wasn't a gentile in the picture there was no christianity and when he says i only say what i heard my father say and I only do what i saw my father do where did he say that and where did he do that it's all in the old testament 
And that's why Jesus keeps pointing back to it, because I only do, I only say, I only do, I only say, I only do. And the patterns are extraordinary. So much so that little subtleties like in the beginning, God did not speak until the spirit fell. When Jesus came up out of the water, God did not speak until the spirit fell. Is that a pattern? That breaking through the water, that the power and the anointing comes through God speaking through the Holy Spirit, and that's the pattern for us. I should never open my mouth unless the spirit falls first. Oh, what come on, is that pattern of God? I, I need a hanky now to, to wave it a little bit. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, Guys, this book is so hot off the press that the only place you're going to be able to get it right now is on Amazon because even Eric had to get his copy off of Amazon instead of Defender <laughs> because it's really hard right now to get books into print. Just to be just to honest, it's hard because of, of a paper shortage. And so they're there on Amazon here before too much longer. They'll be on, on Defender. Guys, this, this book is going to be a paradigm shift for you back to kingdom. And I think that's what we need in this day and this hour. Amen. You, you have been such a wonderful friend and a wonderful supporter. And to know that it has your blessing that this is kingdom. All I've ever wanted to be is a part of the kingdom. I don't want to be a Lone Ranger. I don't want to be a name. I don't want to be a celebrity. I, who I am is meaningless. Meaningless, it's all meaningless. But being a part of the kingdom and making a difference in the kingdom and being a bearer of light for the kingdom is my heart's desire. And if I can shed light into one dark space where people are sitting in the pews, questioning what they're hearing and saying this doesn't add up, I pray that this book will help it add up for them and they can begin their own pursuit, which was the assignment to begin with. For the assembly of the brethren was not to become the place where you learned all about God, uh, you got a message, you got life application, you had fellowship, but your other six days a week was your responsibility. This is a guide to say, hey, here's what's going on, and maybe you need to go back and read Genesis 1-1 again. Yeah. And see the big picture and get to know my friend Moses. He's a really cool guy. And it will cause you to understand Jesus in a new light. Because right now, guys, everything and I, I want to end with this everything in the world is either attacking moses or it's attacking jesus yes uh the very root of communism started by a false jewish messiah named jacob frank who hated moses with a passion he inspired hitler he inspired mao he inspired marx he and he inspired most of the dnc and then probably half of the rnc guys and it, it, it's it's do away with all of it because they, they, they want to expunge God off of this planet. And with that kind of resistance, we need to learn how to hook onto that titanium cable. Yes. And to get rooted and grounded in Christ. And to do that, we got to start all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Amen. 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 So cover the book, 3.15, the Genesis of all prophecy. Rabbi Eric Walker, Defender Publishing, forward by Carl Gallops, with um, humbled by the outpouring of support and uh, with it only being on Amazon doing as well as it, it, is, it, as it is and uh, having the wonderful friends at Skywatch, which are great friends of yours as well. Uh, terrific people, wonderful people, blessed and honored to be a part of this and a part of what you're doing as always. God bless you both very much and thank you so much for this opportunity well, readers let's go ahead thank and you, Rabbi. let's jump on amazon let's let make that thing be the number one bestseller this next week as we release this and give it an extra little kudo there that'll because you know when, when people don't realize when you do that it causes it to be displayed to so many more people that minded I'll, I'll get that because it's a number one bestseller and it might they might find christ in the midst amen so I'm excited about that. Gentlemen, thank you for being on today. We could have probably went two hours because it's we have we have three old friends getting together. 
and and talking the word and it's just so exciting thank you guys thank you god bless you both what a wonderful time together thank you shalom shalom stay informed tune in to weekly podcast by dr michael and mary lou lake to keep you informed inspired and empowered in the kingdom of god tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com that's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.